Hey gang, before we get into this next episode, can I just say it would mean the world to me if you can go ahead and like this episode and also subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't yet. Plus, if you enjoy the episode, sharing the content with your friends, family, coworkers, or anyone else you think might benefit from what you're hearing, it helps so much. It's not just about the algorithm, it's about sharing the ideas that are being talked about on this show and creating more community through compassion. So again, if you enjoy the show and you like what you're hearing, don't be afraid to subscribe. It means more than you can possibly know. And frankly, at the end of the day, it means that we get to engage more with each other and that's really what this is all about. Hey gang, I'm Nikki LaCroce and you're listening to The Fuck. And on today's episode, I'm sharing the mic with Roxanne Chapu. And Roxanne is a globally recognized luminary inspirer, celestial guide, celestial and generational earth shaman, the creator of the Illumination Retreat and the host of the Soul to Soul podcast with Roxanne. I am super excited to have her here. She is such an enlightened human and soul and beautiful soul. Um, just from our first meeting, it was immediately apparent and I'm thrilled to have you here and to dive into your experiences. So welcome to the show, Roxanne. Thank you so much, Nikki, for having me. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. So let's do this. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I feel like there's so much to your story. I think there's a lot to all of our stories in reality, right? But you have, um, obviously, as I mentioned, a lot of connection to the divine, to source, to soul. And I thought a good place to start might be how you landed in this place? Because I don't know that we all start from a place of, of that understanding of connection. So um, can you share a little bit about how you found yourself not only interested in, but feeling called towards this? Yeah, absolutely. That's such a beautiful question, Nikki. Ever since I was a little girl, I just had this profound knowingness that I was being called to serve. And it was like divine guidance was guiding me throughout this journey. And I've always been very connected to the angelic lineages. I would always hear their whispers as a, as a small child, even to this day, every time I would go through something very challenging, it was like, I was always very positive and very optimistic. And I looked at life like it was just a beautiful experience and that I was learning and growing from. And I remember, you know, family members and friends looking at me and being like, you know, why are like, how are you so positive when all this stuff is happening? And it's just like, I had this knowingness because these whispers would come to me at a very young age, just saying that everything was going to be okay and to keep pushing. And, you know, like that's kind of what happened throughout my whole life. And I'd always try and resonate and connect with other people. And I'd always, you know, tell them that I felt like this burning desire and that I felt that I was being guided. And I just had like this really, like, it was like a bigger feeling than me. It was like, a, it was like a global feeling that I knew I was going to be serving at a global level. And I would ask my family and friends, like, do you feel this burning feeling? And they're like, well, no, like, you know, I don't have that feeling, but like, I know I want to be like a lawyer or a doctor. And I was like, well, that's amazing. But I said, like, it was something different. And everyone that I would encounter, I'd kind of, I'm a very deep thinker, very, you know, deep conversationalist. And I would always try and have like very deep conversations. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> and people would be like, oh my goodness, like, you're, you're so profound and you're so wise, you know, like you're an old soul. And I was like, oh, like, does not everybody have like these conversations, but I was really trying to resonate at the level of, do they feel the way that I do? Because I just wanted to fit in and be quote unquote normal. Right? Ooh, and I want, yeah, that hits. I, want, I wanted to know that like what I was feeling was somewhat normal or that somebody else had that feeling, you know, as I did. And I went through life. I went through a lot of trials and tribulations, a lot of learning experiences, very unhealthy relationships. So very unhealthy marriage. I ended up leaving with my three beautiful children. And, you know, I take accountability and awareness of that relationship and every relationship that I've been into, because now I know, you know, what part I had to play and what choices I had to make for my life. And, you know, after I had left that relationship, I experienced four near death experiences simultaneously, one after the other. And each near death experience brought me even closer to my true sacred purpose and to my knowingness. And it was like, I was debunking, I was deconstructing who I thought I was, who I thought I should be. And I was coming back to the essence of who I innately was in my own divine presence and why I came here to serve in mm -hmm. terms of this timeline and my sacred purpose. 
and it was coming to me in little pieces, like a, like puzzle pieces. And I was gathering all of this data and I was gathering all of this information and I was trying to understand what the puzzle was going to look like, what the vision was going to look like. And I still don't know the full vision and never will in this lifetime. I don't believe, but I understand what I'm supposed to be doing in this lifetime. And I know that I'm in alignment right now. So I did a lot of self-discovery, a lot of soul and self mastery journey, a lot of soul and self discovery, acceptance, loving myself. And then I was called in my dream state by my ancestors to step into our, you know, our tribal community of healing, which I believe that I was a healer in many, many, many lives, just because the information that comes to me, however, you know, that was something of its own. It was a very beautiful experience. And now I'm, you know, trying to explore those gifts and I've been exploring them for several years. So it's just all been a learning and really following myself and following my intuition, following my guidance and seeing where I'm being led opposed to, you know, trying to control where I'm being led. Mm. So many things that you said there resonate the first being, you know, that, that desire to connect deeply with other people, um, in this, in this world that we're living in this life that we, we have, I, since I was a young child, I feel like I've desperately craved that, um, closeness on an intimate, like spiritual level, even though I don't, I would never have identified it as that, um, when I was younger or even (laughs) younger being even a few years ago, but, I remember when I came to the realization that my purpose was to connect with people. And that's sort of how this pod, that is how this podcast came to be ultimately was that longing, that desire, that knowing that what you are intended to do here is to help the collective in some way. And I feel like it can be really challenging to identify what that actually looks like. Because the knowing is one thing, the execution is another. Um, And so when you, I mean, you've obviously, um, you're speaking to angelic lineage and things like that. So I'm going to ask you to maybe educate a little, if you don't mind, while we're here in the, in the depth of the conversation of your story, I want to make sure there's a balance of you sharing who you are and and all of that, because that's the the root of the show. But I also don't want to lose listeners because they are, please don't take this offensively. This is more of a generalized statement that people think things are woo woo. And I really want people to be open-minded to what other experiences there are that we might not be having or that we potentially don't understand so that we can learn and educate ourselves. And if you feel an interest in that as a listener, you can go look into that more, follow more of Roxanne's work, find other people that you're interested in learning from and about. Um, just, I feel like it would be great if you, if you don't mind providing a little bit of education around that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I love what you're saying about the whole woo woo concept. And I think that we always attribute this when we, we, we don't understand something and that's perfectly fine. Again, that comes back to our own consciousness and our own awareness of what is and what isn't, you know, I think that it can be a very challenging complex for us to think that there's nothing outside of ourselves or things that are unseen that are happening around us on a daily basis. Even though so much of it is like so much of it is, there's such a limited view of what we have. Like, look at the Wi-Fi that happens in our house. Look at the satellite, you know, signals happen. Like everything isn't seen, but we know that it's there. So it doesn't not necessarily have to always be, you know, scientifically or measurably proven. It's been in, you know, spiritual scriptures for hundreds and thousands of years. So Mm -hmm. When we talk about spiritual connection, when we talk about, you know, connecting with divine intelligence or divine information, it doesn't mean that everyone is going to be in connection with the angels. And that's the angelic lineage that I'm talking to. I've always had the angels with me. I always feel their presence. Now that I'm more in tune to my gifts, I see their presence. I hear their channeling a little bit more clearly, but In reality, it's all information that we're all equipped to be in connection with because it's divine intelligence. It's always there. We don't even understand as human beings what is happening in our own universe, let alone the omniverse. So to say that there's another life forces or other 
beings or other creatures that are here and designed. There's a reason why angels are in every religious scriptures. There's reasons why, you know, that we are talking about these things because it's really important because these things are valid just because we can't see it with the naked eye when we're not in our state of consciousness or awareness doesn't mean that they're not rightfully there. So I think that that's a really important thing. So, and most children that are very in tune, and it doesn't mean that you know, most children are divine. Every child that comes into this lifetime is from divine essence, is a divine being, has divine intelligence, has divine connection. It's just, is their upbringing, you know, encouraging them to connect with that? Or is it doing the latter where it's never discussed and it's never honored and it's Mm. never respected and taught? When we look at the ancient tribal communities, it's all about spiritual context. When we think about, you know, shamanism, shamans, you know, any practitioners, ancient healing practitioners, they're there from spiritual practices because they understand that it's not just the physical body that we're dealing with. We're dealing with the energetic and spiritual body as well, as well as the emotional body and the intellectual body. So we don't even see our energy field around us yet. It has been proven in science that we do have an energy field. We are made of energy, right? And we know from energy and we know from science and religious structures that energy cannot be created by man, nor can it be destroyed. So that means that our energy has lived countless of life cycles, regardless if we believe in reincarnation or not, it has lived countless of life cycles, right? So It's really interesting and really fathomable when we really put things into perspective and we bring it down to more of a scientific measurement. When everything is, you know, pointing and suggesting to the same thing, there must be some truth to it, right? Mm So it's because we're not fully cognizant of what that is. A lot of people didn't even understand that they had a soul, right? That we had soul essence and we're, that's who we are without us, without that soul essence, we wouldn't have life within our body because that's the energy matrix that keeps us alive. Yeah. So when we understand that our energy field around us, you know, like anyone who walks into a room, either you believe, you know, more in science or, or spirituality, when you walk into a room, someone can be 200 feet away from you. And when you see their presence, energetically, your energy matrix is already speaking to them and you already have a connection. You're already making decisions if you feel this person is in alignment with you or not. Ooh, wow, yeah. that person has amazing energy or wow, you know, that person is taking up all the energy into the room, right? You, Your energy, your energy matrix is already making decisions and it's hitting your intuition and then it's going up into the intellectual body. What most people don't understand is that we have over five different brains within our body, which has just been proven in science. They actually think we have seven. So we have the brains that are happening within our actual, like within our head space. So we have about three to four brains within there. Then we have a brain that happens within our intuition. So the brain of our intuition, our intuitive knowingness is 99% accurate opposed to our logical sense of thinking, which is 94%. So that goes to show that our intuitive knowingness, right? We don't fully understand ourselves, let alone just our spirituality and our energetic and our cellular complex that surrounds us. So what I would invite people is to be curious about yourself, be curious of exploring who you innately are. Most people don't even know what organs they have in their body or what their muscles are, what their, you know, their bone structure is. So it's really to come to that understanding. Oh, gosh, that was so beautifully explained. Thank you. I feel like I could listen to you just talk all day about this, which is great (laughs) that I have you here at least for a little while. Um, So the part that you mentioned, too, about, you know, we just don't even know ourselves that well at a physiological level, the way that it's even written in science to date exempt from what you just shared has also been discovered, right? Like the things that we learn in school even is not entirely what we could know about ourselves. And even if it were, how much do we retain, pay attention, care? Um, Because if it's not, it's sort of an out of sight, out of mind mentality um, to your point. And the other thing that you said that stuck out to me instantly when you started explaining that was, but what about Wi-Fi? (laughs) It's like, the cloud, the cloud, right? Like the cloud, yeah. <laughs> this magical cloud. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're like, just put all of your information there. It's totally fine, but it's very difficult to believe that there's other elements to our soul. It, and it's, I love that you dialed it in that way because it really 
shows our ability to kind of justify what our belief system is rooted in collective thought that is socially acceptable or or vastly present and communicated um, through mainstream sources. Whereas what you're talking about and what you've experienced and what many, many other people experience, and this is, again, separate of religion, because religion to me is more of a vehicle through which... Yep your soul and um, divine connection can be expressed. It People take it too far and they turn it into something that it really, I don't think was ever intended to be. Um, whereas what you're doing is you're saying this starts from within. It requires us to have faith. And and my family and I have had conversations about this. Faith and religion are different things. Yeah. Um, and so having that faith and trusting your knowing, I love the, I'm, I'm going to Google so much about, um, the, the various <laughs> brains and, and intellectual, um, sort of components of our, or not even intellectual, intelligent components of our bodies. Um, but when you look at it that way, it's like, it, it, it allows you to separate who you are in this world right now and everything around you from what actually feels right to you or feels in congruence with who you are. And so from what you were saying earlier, that's something that you've really felt since you were a child. And because you had these near-death experiences, it sounds like that really accelerated your um, possibly interest, but definitely your trajectory and and your growth into your um, really understanding your soul and um, the lives that you your soul has lived throughout time can you share a little bit about either those experiences or sort of the outcomes of those experiences for you uh, where, wherever you feel like going with that yeah absolutely and you know what's beautiful is that everybody has recognition of their past lives and they may not understand what this is even when we have deja vus like to us that is living in a different parallel and a different realm or a different outcome has occurred and it doesn't mean that it's, it has to be within, you know, the 3D within the linear, but we all have had past lives, regardless if we're newer souls to the earth plane, we have had, we have been energy at some point that was created, maybe combined with another energy source and then kind of mm. been, been like individualized in terms of like our soul lessons and soul presence. But we actually do have a soul memory. So we actually, they have just been proven in science that we don't actually just have two DNA strands. We actually have three DNA strands. And that third DNA strand is called our triple helix. It's our cellular complex of our soul memory. So our soul has memory. So sometimes what happens in this lifetime doesn't make sense to us on why we react or why we have patterns or cycles from this current lifetime, because it's actually complexes that are coming from previous lifetimes of experiences that we've had and that have occurred. Can I ask a question real quick on that? How how does that differentiate from like general uh, generational trauma? Because I I think that there, that could be conflated. Yeah. So generational trauma has to do with our epigenetics. Our epigenetics are our genetics that are within us that are malleable. So epigenetics are things that have happened, you know, a history of time. If we have been exposed in generations of unhealthy cycles of relationship of, you know, of financial, you know, detriment and, you know, no success in terms of like, you know, love and capacity, you know, have you ever met like families that they're just like, we have the worst of luck, like from generation and generation, worst of luck. Well, that has also something to do with epigenetics and it has something to do with entanglements as well, which we can talk about a bit later, but epigenetics are something that are malleable, that are changeable. So that is the importance of why we're realizing why the research is proving that we really need to start going into generational healing, because when we heal one aspect of a cycle or a pattern, we're not just healing the future cycles and the future generations we're actually healing back two generations and we're healing the lineage. And that's the importance of that work. If we, if we choose or if we're called to step in to heal that aspect of our generational lineage. So it's really powerful. Generational work is really, really powerful. The thought processes that come with generational thinking, if you were raised in a home that, you know, um, didn't have a lot of financial success and had a lot of financial struggle, you're going to hear conversations like money doesn't grow on trees. Money is this money is evil. Like you're going to have all of these conceptualizations 
of what money is or what a healthy relationship is or what a marriage should be, because these are words that have been ingrained into your slate and into your genetics. What the beautiful thing is, is that we have the option to change that within our epigenetics because they're malleable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, because I feel like the way that you're explaining it and and sort of going into the past life side of things. Um, I, I also love, by the way, that you explain that our energies could be um, commingled effect, essentially, right? And I think that idea is really interesting too, because the way we see ourselves is so, it, it's it's hard to not, it's hard to imagine your energy, what you feel within your soul existing outside of like the body that you know. And so being able to get to a place where you can think about it just very scientifically from the standpoint of we are all energy, energy, as you said, cannot be created or destroyed. So it's been somewhere, it's done something else a lot of times, probably. <laughs> it has, it has. And, you know, that's the really beautiful thing. And there's a reason why science has proven that. And there's a reason why, you know, it's in every religious scripture, because it's true, right? When you, when I'm doing a death and dying ceremony for someone who's someone who's going to the next transition of their life, it's their soul is leaving their body and I'm carrying the soul with me like past, you know, I won't go too much into detail just because I know that some people may not be into the spiritual, you know, conversation, but we're bringing them to pass the veil and we're bringing them back to the afterlife so they can go through their reincarnation process, regardless if that's coming back to the earth plane or not. So we see that soul body leave, you know, the physical body. And I'm sure if you've ever witnessed somebody leaving, you can see that something has changed in the demeanor of their look. And it's not just because they've passed. It's because that soul energy has left the body. Mm. Um, I do kind of want you to go down that path if you're open to, <laughs> but I don't want it to serve as a total detour. So even if we put a pin in that and you just explain it to me later, that's good. So it's your call. <laughs> yeah. So our, our death and dying ceremonies. And I also do this with clients that aren't going through the transitional period. And I do this with a lot of my mentees is that, it's really important to understand where our energy was created from. And either if you believe in God, you know, the universe creator, whatever that is for you, for you to be able to see where you actually came from and to understand the contracts that you had in order to come here and the experiences that you had to come here. And it's a really powerful thing because it also reveals your sacred purpose, why you came here and what you came to learn and what you came to do in order to serve the collective. Nobody came here to not serve the collective or they wouldn't be born in this timeline, right? Or any timeline. Regardless, if we understand what that serving is, it doesn't mean it has to be at a global level. It doesn't mean that it even has to be, you know, expansive and publicly known. It could be something that you do with agriculture. It can be something that you serve with the animal kingdom. It could be the relationships that you foster and that you nourish. Like it can be anything in terms of that, that is serving the collective and serving obviously your highest self and your purpose. So when people go through this journey, so what happens is that we are a multidimensional being proven in science, proven in religion. Like, I'm just going to keep reiterating that because I love it. I, Please do reinforce it. <laughs> I think it's really important. So we're multidimensional beings. So we know that we have an emotional body. We know that we have a physical and intellectual and emotional, a spiritual and astral body. So it's really important for us to know that when we are at a multidimensional level, that our, our spiritual body can leave the physical body and it can go through journey and it can understand things that more of like, think about like an astral projection. So astral projection is when the soul leaves the body and it explores the cosmic waves and it explores infinite intelligence. And then it comes back and it gets grounded back into the body. It's common. It's almost like a very deep, deep meditative state where they go into their theta state, but then they're actually going and they're leaving the soul body is leaving the body. Mm, wow. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you for going down that path for me. Um, so sorry to, to go back. I, I, I am inevitably detouring on this because I'm just so fascinated by what you do and you're so good at explaining it in a way that is not only informative, but very palatable. I feel like it's helpful to hear from someone who is saying all of this with a greater understanding of the scientific and religious um, components to it. I think it's really easy for people to share stories and feel a little bit like, well, like, how do I buy into that? Um, and you're coming, as they like to say, with the receipts, which I appreciate. <laughs> so 
Um, and you know what I think is really cool too, Nikki, is like when we think about religion, um, you know, this is something that we were actually talking in within our tribal community and in our sharing circle, but a lot of the times we don't want to believe in spirit and we don't want to believe in energy or ghosts or anything like that of that nature, which I don't believe any of those things, um, you know, have the power to go over us. I think that there are such thing as possessions. Um, that's why, you know, so many religious structures have like depossession or they do exorcisms because they know that something can, an entity can latch on to another entity because mm-hmm. it's energy. So when we understand that there's so much more around us and, and even in scripture that we're just not acknowledging because we just think that it's woo woo. There's a reason why hundreds and thousands of years of religion and, you know, scriptures show the same thing and prove to the same thing. Right. So it's kind of unavoidable at that yeah. point. Yeah, totally. Um, great. Thank you. Thank you for going down that road with me. Um, so back to the question that I originally asked you, and I will do my best to not disrupt <laughs> is, um, <laughs> you know, how, how did you really find yourself in this place? How did your near death experiences, um, really affect the way that you moved into this part of your life? You know, I think Nikki, it really, made me start questioning a lot of things, a lot of things that I thought were truth, but really were somebody else's truth and Mm. weren't my truth. And I think as a spiritual leader, it's really important for me every time I'm in teaching. And as I'm in teaching, I'm in learning as well, is that I always tell them, don't take what I say as your truth, take what you feel as your truth and go in the resonance of your own truth. That's true leadership, right? Because you're following your own inner guidance, just because my perspective and my truth is something doesn't mean necessarily that it has to be someone else's. If there's something that feels in resonance and it feels like it's right within your intuitive knowingness, then you know, you're on to something. So for me, it was really exploring, really expanding if my soul could speak in this now moment, what would it tell me? If my heart could speak to me, what would it say to me? My body could speak to me, what would it say to me? And really listening to the feedback of what my body is trying to tell me, because we're multidimensional beings, a lot of the times what we see, and we see it right now that's happening globally throughout the world, is there is a huge mental health crisis because one, the emotional body isn't talking to the intellectual body and it's not connecting with the spiritual or the physical body. And they're not working in a synergy. They're not working in harmony. They're working against one another. So it's really important as a multidimensional being that we're working in alignment. So I really had to come to my centers in all aspects of my being. And what did it take for me to do that? Well, one, I had to start healing my intellectual thinking without healing that first, I can't even progress to anything different because I'm going to stay limited within my belief systems, right? That's the power of belief systems. So what are my core values? Are they truly my core values? So it's like debunking, deconstructing, and really starting to build my own foundation of my own belief systems and building my home, my dream home with that new foundation, essentially, right? So yeah. It was really more of the intellectual level. And then I moved myself into the emotional body. Where am I keeping my emotions? What have I, like, what have I not expressed? Well, you know, have I stepped into my power of advocacy? Have I stepped into my power of voice? Am I actually speaking what's on my mind? Or am I speaking what everybody else or what I think everybody else wants to hear? Right. So people would ask, are you okay? Or like, how's life? I'm like, oh, great, this, that. But in reality, when I really look at it, no, my life was shit. You know what I mean? Like, no, I feel you. (laughs) I wasn't truly happy. I wasn't truly fulfilled. Like, let's just be honest. I wasn't at peace with myself. I allowed everything outside of myself to regulate my emotions and to regulate my self-worth and my self-value. Right. So it came to a place of self-acceptance, loving my dark, loving my light, loving all the shades that were within me and really bringing those things to light and loving every aspect of who I was, regardless if I thought it was socially acceptable or not, because I'm over that shit. You know what I mean? Like (laughs) that's what happens when we pressurize and we suppress aspects of ourselves is that we leads into depression. It leads into anxiety because there's an emotional disconnection and we're disconnected from our soul. So it was really important for me to understand that. And then from that emotional, I went to the energetic and the cellular body where when I was called, you know, by my ancestors, by dream to come and to like learn what I needed to learn. And then I moved into the physical body for the last several years. And 
physical body, releasing pain, releasing, you know, dis-ease and disease in my body. Like I had so many issues, so many emotions trapped within my body. Your body keeps score of everything, right? It had memories in my body that I was releasing and really deep, profound stretches that I was listening to my own body's guidance on what I needed to do to do those things and that's the power is that we have the power to heal ourselves and we know that we cut our arm and what happens our body naturally knows how to heal itself but what happens when we're at the emotional body or the intellectual or the energetic we get in the way and we create blocks and barriers like putting a pebble into the wound and then expecting it to heal properly oh yeah that's a good analogy yeah so that's, that's what that is. So it was me doing that own self work before I really stepped into my body of work. So I feel like the sort of the um, timeline or not even timeline, the sequence of events rather that you described really aligns with what my own experience has been thus far. Um, particularly with that recognition that at an intellectual level, you need to acknowledge really who you, who you are, who you want to be and ask yourself, you know, is the way that I'm living right now, exemplifying that? Do I embody that within me? And when you made the comment about really looking at your core values and asking yourself what those were, it hits so close to home, Roxanne, because when my wife and I met Um, and it was very shortly after my mom had passed away. And so, you know, the idea of divine timing certainly rings true to me and, she and I, you know, just really connected instantly. We we're able to talk about a ton of things. And we were kind of just going back and forth on just what it is that we want or need or even expect from ourselves and other people. And I had sent her a list of core values that I had found somewhere online, I think like Pinterest or something. I was just scrolling and I was like, you know, I feel like this is a long list, but it's very, very reasonable. Like they're all things that you would want. You're like, okay, loyalty, honesty, integrity. These are, you know, very fundamental, basic things, but there's also other ones that we don't necessarily immediately think of like generosity or, um, you know, open-mindedness, things like that. And so I used that core values list as a mechanism to also help me through that emotional uh, growth, because I saw it as a way to challenge myself if I was embodying that if I was being true to myself in those values. But it also prompted me to make a list of like what my wants, needs and deal breakers were in relationships, because I had just gotten out of this very toxic, abusive marriage. And so it was like, I need to not only understand what it is that I want and who I want to be and how I want to show up in the world or even how I am. But I need to understand more behind the why and what that looks like from the inside. And doing that opened up so much more for me in terms of, as you said, self-acceptance, self-love, the ability to regulate our own perception versus asking, you know, for continuous validation or seeking continuous validation externally. And it fundamentally shifted the way that I see myself and the way that I show up in the world. So I cannot emphasize enough the importance of those two parts of it. Um, And I think that when you get into the more spiritual and, um, and physical side of it, those things have so much power in their own right. But it's very difficult to have, I think, the outcomes maybe or or the the transformation that you're seeking if you don't take those other steps first because you're going to continuously be longing for something if you haven't identified yet you know what it is really that you're um that you're aligned to at your at your core so i really appreciate that you went there and in particular leaning into the somatic side of things where like you have to release things from your body i have found that going to a place where you like you allow yourself feel to this has been a common theme in this season is allow yourself to feel your feelings not just intellectualize your feelings when my therapist first said that to me I was like mildly offended I was like wait a second no I'm I'm an emotional (laughs) person I I know what I'm feeling she's like no no I know that you know what you're feeling but are you feeling what you're feeling and I'm like "Mm." Am I? No, no, probably not. You know. As soon as we have resistance, we know we've hit truth. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. Yes. I love that. Yes. And so I, I feel like it's really important for people to really consider what 
you can do and how you can move through these parts of our growth and recognize that as Roxanne, you're talking about sort of the sequence of events that happened. And I'm reiterating that for myself, that it isn't linear, right? It, it's it's a constant sort of ebb and flow of those things. And so you you may be doing multiple things at once that are contributing to that. You might be focused more on one element of your life than another. But at the end of the day, the important thing is, is that you are, as you said, listening to yourself, looking inward and challenging yourself about if the way that you're showing up intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, physically aligns to what it is that you're seeking. Um, and again, that's seeking internally. That's not looking for the validation everywhere else. And it can be daunting. I think it's very easy to doubt ourselves in those moments. But what do you feel is a good way to kind of navigate those moments? Maybe when you do feel that resistance when you're in it, regardless of what stage you're at. When you feel resistance, you always ask, why am I feeling resistance to this? Because there's always something that is deeply and painfully rooted within, you know, the cellular complex energy. And that's what I always say. It's always in the cellular energy field because it's in our energy field, regardless if it's held in the body or not. And the most important thing is understanding why, why do I feel this way in this now moment? You know, what is triggering this? What is activating this? Why am I so resistive to this? Why am I resistive to feedback? Why am I resistive to someone, you know, giving their perspective and sharing their perspective because there's some truth to it. And that means that that truth has not been accepted within ourselves yet. And we haven't taken the awareness and the conscious awareness to have that. And a lot of the times what happens is that it's kind of, you know, sneaky in the subconscious and the hyperconscious where we're not actually able to bring it down to the conscious until something like that has been activated. And this is where a lot of the times our relationship dynamics, even, you know, intimate, you know, parents, siblings, anything like that, they're always like mirrors. They're always presenting us where we need to grow and where we need to, you know, focus on in terms of, you know, maybe I didn't react the way that I really wanted to in that situation? How could I have handled that better? Why is somebody else's actions or words affecting my own emotional regulation and affecting my own inner peace? Yeah. Like that, that is the deeper question, right? Because when you get to a point in your spirituality in terms of your understanding of yourself, it's more of the observer, more of the witnesser of witnessing your own behaviors, witnessing your own reactivity and really not allowing external things to affect your emotional regulation, understanding we're human beings, we're going to feel emotions. That's how we connect with one another. And it's a very powerful thing. And like you said, it's really important for us to feel all of our emotions and to process them. I'm feeling really sad today. I'm feeling really sad in this now moment. Why am I feeling this way? You know, yeah. Somebody said something that I felt like was criticism, but they were really coming from a place of in love. You know, was their was their intention really malice or was it really coming from a place that they really want to see me do better in there? And really having those honest and candid conversations with yourself, right? And we can't have relationships that don't help us grow because there's no point of that relationship. And with, you know, with growing comes pain. Unfortunately, we have to go through those emotions to understand the polarity of who we are, to understand how it impacts us. Mm -hmm. So if, if something, you know, my partner says, you know, angers or frustrates me and I'm resistive to it right away, I know right away that I need to dig a little bit deeper because it all has to do with me, it has nothing to do with them. Yeah, I love that you said that. Um, my wife and I have in the last couple of weeks had a few moments where we have been tense with each other and the most beautiful thing about it, which was hard to see in the moment, um, was that it forced us to really look at ourselves differently because of how we each handled it, because we are not a high conflict couple. I was in a relationship like that. I know that that is not healthy and I don't want to be part of that. But because we are so aligned in a lot of ways, when those conflicts happen or when those disconnects happen, it feels almost more personal. And then you're like, why though? Because it doesn't happen. So now it, it really forces you to be like, no, I have to go deeper because we're so good in all these ways. What is it that's, you know, bubbling up and coming to the surface in these moments that allows us to respond in these ways that are not typical to us, but also not desired? Like when you use the word reactive, I mean, that's honestly the word that's come up a lot for me because I can be very impulsive with my frustration 
And for me to be able to be at more peace and be a better partner, like it, to be a better partner, it requires me to be at more peace with myself. And what I feel in my body when I'm super reactive is a physical sense of rage. And so it's like, what's coming up for me? How do I navigate that in a way that allows me to process my emotions and be honest with myself, but not projecting that to somebody else, because that's really about what's within me. And that's your defense mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. So that's your defense mechanism that's rising when we're frustrated or anything like that of that nature. It's our defense mechanism. And once we have that command that happens in, you know, our neurological senses, it's very challenging for us to break that cycle. So that's why, you know, so many studies and habits, it has to be consistency and practice in order to choose something of the latter. But when something causes us pain and we continuously do it, that's an even deeper question is why would I self-sabotage myself in a way to be able to feel that way? Right. So when yes, we think- I was looking that up after those conversations. <laughs> so I was like, what's the deal? <laughs> but, you know, it's also coming from a place of compassion and learning and understanding. And, you know, we're not, we're going to fuck up in life. That's just a natural part of our evolution. And it's important. And I don't really consider it, you know, fuck ups because those mistakes are so important in life. That's why we call them in our tribal community mistakes, because you're literally learning and you're gaining experience and you're gaining wisdom from doing that very action and from having that reaction. Oh shit, that doesn't feel good in the resonance of me. That doesn't feel in alignment with me. Why do I feel this way? And why do I want to continue to feel this way? Right? Like that's the deeper question. And, you know, having those honest conversations with yourself, having that honest dialect with myself, because a lot of the times, like no relationship is perfect. And if people say their relationship is perfect, they're lying to themselves. It means they're not being honest about their perspectives and they're not being honest about their growth because in reality, no two people have the same perspective and no two people have the same experience. We're here to help grow. And if you're not growing and you're not evolving, you're not with the right partner, Mm. right? And you're not being honest in your relationship. It doesn't mean it has to be high conflict, but to say that there's never going to be a disagreement or tense moments, that, that's nonsense. That's why it's better or for worse in every in every capacity. Yeah, right. There are some very, you know, dark moments, but how do we take those dark moments and how do we learn to fight with love? And how do we learn to have conversations with love instead of blaming, shaming, and guilting? You know, and then that's mm. a really important dynamic that needs to happen happen. Yeah, I love the way that you explained that. And I also really appreciate that you used the phrase or you explained the way that you consider mistakes as like, it's a mistake. It makes me feel like when I screw something up that I'll be like, okay, take two. Like, we'll do that again, you know? (laughs) And you know, like, and that's the thing is like, we, we have such this criticism against, you know, what we call they're like failures, like mini failures that we do, but they're not failures. Those are successes, right? Those are, those are learning opportunities. Those yeah. are growing opportunities. It's all about our perception. It's all about our perspective, you know? And once we get away from that, then I tell my kids all the time, like go and make as many mistakes as you can, because that's how you're going to learn. That's mm-hmm. how you learn that's how you're going to grow you're going to know what feels good for you you're going to know what doesn't feel good for you and then you're going to make your own decisions as your own little human being and you're going to decide what you want to feel like you can choose a path where you can be in misery and self-sabotaging behaviors or you can choose a path where you feel at love and you feel at peace within yourself and fulfilled yeah that's really beautiful and i appreciate that that's the way you approach life and and as a parent because one of the things that is particularly challenging. When I was growing up, my parents were very supportive and understanding and I think attentive as well as it could be to my sisters and my emotional needs and and all other needs. But they didn't have the tools that we have today to help inform some of those conversations. And so I think even if you know, my parents had the perspective that you have where it's like, go make mistakes. You have to, like, that's going to happen. I mean, my mom would always say that's why they have erasers on the end of pencils, right? Like that's why we, we understand we're inherently going to make mistakes, but it's how you move through those mistakes that really defines who you are and you have a choice in that. And so for your own experiences and, and really acknowledging, you know, I have a choice in where my life goes. I've made these decisions to work on these inner parts of myself. It sounds like based on some of the 
um, things you were asking yourself, doing some shadow work and really getting in there and being like, what is it that is holding me back? Or what is it that will help me shine my light even brighter? Um, was there a point or has there been a point um, that you feel like there was a significant amount of clarity. I, I know that we're sort of ever evolving. So it's not to say, you know, you've reached like the pinnacle of where you want to be, but um, do you have any real defining moments in that clarity and that light that you you've found? Yeah, absolutely. This happened about several years ago where I was in a journey of a state of like, uh, I was actually in a really deep state of my theta state and I was journeying. So for most people who don't even know, maybe know what shamans are, shamans were like, you know, the spiritual doctors, the herbal doctors, the medicine doctors of the tribal communities for over hundreds and thousands of years. And what shamans do is they go through journey and they go and kind of what we were talking about a little bit earlier. And we go and we travel and we astral project. And I was on this journey before and it was teaching me how to surrender. Like what I was being guided was to really understand how to surrender. And it was showing me the laws of nature, the laws of the omniverse. And it was, it was incredibly powerful. And a lot of it just had to do with surrendering and trusting, even though we just say it's just, that is the most challenging thing to do as a human being, because we want to control everything and we want to know everything because we fear the unknown. And that's just a natural part of our reptilian brain. So when we, when we come to a place where we're actually fully surrendering every expectation and every aspect of our path, and we're just doing the actions that feel in alignment with us, it was such a powerful realization. And it took this huge pressure off of myself that I had to be in control of something that I had to fix something that I had to do something where I allowed myself to just be and be a human being opposed to a human doing. And that realization right there opened up these gates to abundantly manifest everything that I desired for my life because I released the expectation to outcome and I stopped resisting and I stopped creating blocks for myself. Because a lot of the times what happens in life is that, you know, we want something in our life and we're so fixated and we're so focused on it. But the very thing that we're doing is we're creating resistance around that because we're coming from scarcity, fear, and lack. We're not coming from knowingness and trusting. So it was a really, really important lesson for me. And from that moment, I've had a lot of moments where I felt like a very profound inner peace, but it was almost like a, it was like an even deeper sense of profound inner peace. It was like every part of my multidimensionality just completely surrendered opposed to where you know, inside was starting to feel really good, but then probably I was probably fighting myself a little bit still in like my spiritual essence where I was trying to understand my spiritual ego, you know? So it was just like this complete surrender of where my path is meant to lead. I'm going to allow it to, to reveal itself and to show itself to me instead of trying to make something work that isn't in alignment for me. And that was a really powerful thing for me. Yeah. That's a, it's really cool to hear that because I think that it's something that anybody who's listening can relate to. We all understand that resistance. And when you speak to the idea of it being more difficult to manifest the things that you want in life, because we sort of have this subconscious resistance uh, where we were in such deep pursuit of something that we're actually kind of holding it at bay. Yeah. I'll be happy when I'll be happy when is one of the biggest resistors, right? I'll be happy when I get, you know, this amount of money. I'll be happy when I get this relationship. I'll be happy when I get the house of our dreams. I'll be happy when, right? It's always, we're already creating that resistance. We're already creating the blocks of resistance for those things to actually come into alignment. And what most people don't understand is that it's not really the law of attraction. That's just like how social media portrays it and the secret and all that. But for me, that's not truth. For me, it's law of vibration and frequency because everything is frequency and everything is vibration. So if my subconscious is telling me, you know, there's things happening in my subconscious that don't believe that I am deserving of a healthy relationship, don't think that I'm worthy of a healthy relationship, don't think I'm worthy of love, but yet every fiber in my in my conscious awareness and my physical being is like, I want love, I want a really good relationship, I want the man of my dreams, I want the woman of my dreams. But in reality, the subconscious is saying that's not what that's not the energy. That's not the vibration and the frequency that you're emitting. Right. Ooh, so yeah. 
everything is vibration. Everything is frequency from the objects in our house to our thoughts, our patterns, thought forms, emotional forms, everything, everything is energy and frequency. So it's about how do I elevate my frequency, right? How do I surrender my frequency so that I can become in alignment with what I'm looking to pull into my life or gravitate into my life? Because if I'm on the 8 a.m., radio frequency and what I want is on an FM radio frequency, it's never going to come into synergetic alignment. It's not meant to be. Yeah. So what does it look like for you to be in vibrational alignment um, in your experience? It's powerful. It's so powerful. And it's funny because it's not even, you know, objects that just necessarily come your way, but the manifestation is like instantaneous where it's super powerful or when you're in connection with someone, they feel your energy because they it, it's, it's a clean energy, right? The energy, the vibration, the frequency is different than when you meet someone who has that a denser energy, you can feel that, right? You yeah. feel you feel the measure and frequency. We just don't know how to actually intellectualize it and, you know, vocabulize it, but we already are measuring those things as a human being everywhere we go, you know? So it's really important, I find, for like vibration and frequency for me to be at a beautiful, at a beautiful state. I also still have dips in my in my vibrational frequency. I still have moments of sadness. I still have a moments of frustration that I know that I continuously need to learn and expand and to grow, right? And that's part of being a human being is growing. I'm getting to a place now where. I'm more of the witnesser. I'm more of the observer. I'm seeing things that are happening, but I'm not interjecting my energy and enmeshing my energy or entangling mm. my energy into these things. I'm just allowing myself to witness and to observe. It is what it is. And it's not something I have control over. All I have control over is my vibrational frequency. It's so important that you say that, I think, especially right now, as we're in the throes of a lot of turmoil in this world, it would be challenging for us to not have dips in our frequency um, in this human experience, because there, there's the obvious direct impact of things that are going on in our personal lives. But as you said, you know, even just with social media or the news or just information that's coming in from these variety of sources, we get pulled into these states of really, I think, significant disconnect from ourselves um, when we're entrenched in that. And I've witnessed it with myself. Like I used to never care at all about watching the news or anything like that. And then I would go through these periods of like very much aggressively watching news. And um, I, I think it's important to say not mainstream media because that stuff is just not up my alley these days, but more just trying to keep aware of what's going on in the world and trying to keep aware of what's going on in the world as somebody who's an empath, it is very challenging for me to do that without feeling a sense of responsibility to somehow help heal the world. And I do feel called to do that in the ways that I can. I find it challenging to, <laughs> I find it challenging to, to fully acknowledge that like, I can't do that. Um, it's just this desire, this, this really desperate desire for people to have peace, to, to be in a place of love and to, to find the understanding of our collective potential. But to put that pressure on yourself to always be up and in a place of love, it's just, it's not realistic. Like we are surrounded by things that are going to challenge that vibration. And as you said, I think this is where it's like, well, I can decide how I respond to it. And the thing that I, I've learned in my experience is it is an ongoing process. You, for instance, like the way that I react when I'm angry, I tell my wife, I'm like, I used to be like up here before I even met her. Like I was up here. I, I was elevated. I was there. And I'm like, so when you feel like I'm frustrated with you, I'm actually like down here. And so there's like a lot further that this has come than you're even witness to. And it's like, so you feel it within you, how you're changing your response and that you're building new patterns for yourself, but it requires a very conscious uh, awareness and willingness to actually activate those parts of ourselves to get to that place of growth. Yeah, I love that, Nikki. And 
You know, I really want to speak to the collective energy because it's really important for us to understand that that collective energy can impact our energy should we choose to step into that entanglement. And it's not about not having awareness of what's happening and transpiring around the world. It's allowing the information to be on our path when we need to understand that information or when we're needed to be informed of that information. So I am not a seeker of information that doesn't serve me because when my energy is down, I can't serve my mentors and I can't serve my clients the way or my family the way that I anticipate because now my energy is entangled with something else that has nothing to do with me, nor do I have control over. And that's the thing is that not one person is responsible for healing the world, nor could we, we would, we would yeah. die trying to do that with our energy field, right? So it's understanding what we are doing and it's not about changing other people. It's about being the change. And that's the most powerful thing is about being who you want the reflection of the world to be. Because when people see that you're happy, you're fulfilled, you're at inner peace and that you're loving life and you're manifesting the things that you desire for your life, What's the first question? How do you do it? How do you do it? How do I get that? Right? So it's not even that we have to seek to give that information is that the right people who are meant to be in your vicinity and come to you on their path for their soul journey will naturally already be gravitated towards you as you be the change for yourself. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So many yeses to that. That's perfect. I, I cannot explain enough how much I also needed to hear that right now. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's easy. I think sometimes as you're, you've been saying to kind of get in our own way when we're, even if we recognize the resistance to give ourselves um, the grace to move through it and think about it less in terms of, well, how do I help everybody else? But it really does come back to your, ability to find that inner peace for yourself. And something that I've recognized in the recent years has been for me, inner peace is a grat, or excuse me, for me, inner peace is a combination of gratitude, love, and joy, and being able to find space for those things that then brings me to a place that is more harmonious. And then when I show up in that way, that the energy around me is more magnetic and people like yourself find their way into my life. And it brings more of that depth of connection that's desired. And also the ability to see how we as individuals can not only leverage like what we're doing for ourselves and for some like ripple effect, but that you can combine energies with other people and create more prolific and pervasive good by just merely understanding one another at that level. Yeah, you know, this is such a beautiful example because when we host retreats, I mean, our retreats are super powerful because you have collective energy and communal energy. But when somebody is able to realize that their energy matrix and their vibration and frequency can be so much different than what they've been experiencing just by either going through journey or going through healing aspects of the retreat, it's so beautiful to see because it really impacts the collective energy because we're sharing space at that, at that moment. Right. So you're able to witness that you're able to see that. And the same happens within a family dynamic and a relationship dynamic. If you react differently in a situation where you normally would have been very reactive and very angry or easily frustrated, it really comes to like what we were talking about before, more of those self-sabotaging behaviors. And even when we like consider social media and like mainstream news, when we're immersed into these things and we're pouring our energy into these things and we're connecting our energy to these things, we're not using it as a tool to be helpful. We're using it as a tool to self-sabotage. So there's a really important thing. We have a choice on social media on how we're going to use that tool. Are we going to immerse ourselves into things that are going to make us feel in alignment and make us feel good? Or are we going to immerse ourselves into things that are are going to hurt us, are going to impact us and bring down our energy and our, our, and our frequency levels? For me, I, I'm not very connected in terms of social media. I just, for me personally, just my own personal belief, I don't, I don't like to spend time on there. I don't like to pour my energy into that. I deliver my content and I remove myself. And even that, I find that can be draining at times. And I only go when I feel a creative sense to do that. So again, it's really circling back about being honest with yourself. Why am I doing this? Why do I feel that I have the weight of the world on my shoulders? When in reality, you didn't create the division, you didn't create 
you know, what's happening throughout the world. And remember what's happening in the world. Those are those people's experiences that they're going through, just like we've had to go through our experiences and we don't have ownership of that. And the importance about the law of nature is that we have the law of polarity, the law of duality. We need dark and we need light, just like the yin yang, right? We need both of these metrics in order to have harmony within the world. So there's there's always going to be something. There's always going to be like a teeter totter when we go from light to dark, light to dark. Yeah, you know, I you've given so many good analogies and perspectives through everything that you've shared today, Roxanne. And I, I, I wish I could just keep you on the line for much, much longer and just continue talking about this. But I, um, the line that was like a very nineties kid thing of me to say, um, the internet I'm line. The same era. I'm the same okay. era. Forget. <laughs> so, you know, um, <laughs> But, you know, um, as we're rounding out the conversation here, and I hope this is one of just of many, um, I'd love to stay connected beyond the show. But do you feel um, called to share anything in particular with listeners about either your experience or how they might enter their journey of self-growth and healing and, and connection to spirituality? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the number one thing I would say is always trust yourself because your soul is always guiding you. It's the ego that gets in the way. And it's not to say or shame the ego. The ego is a very important part of our survival, but it almost over calculates and over analyzes. So it's really important that we start following our intuitive guided and really start following where our soul is guiding us because our soul is leading us down a path that is going to serve us where the path that we're probably leading down right now isn't serving us if this, you know, if this conversation is of any interest, because that would mean that something needs to transpire, something needs to shift, and it's never too late to change something. We always are malleable. We're always allowed to change our mind. We're always allowed to change our direction and our path. And it's never too late to do that. And if you want to feel inner peace and you want to feel fulfillment and you want to feel true happiness, not out of materialistic things or not out of circumstance, then you need to start following where your body and where your soul is guiding you because it has been guiding you. It's just, it's not being heard. Thank you so much for saying that you can choose to change. That is one of the most challenging realizations to come to when you are stuck in a rut. And it is the most pivotal thing that needs to happen to be able to move to the next stage of your life, whatever that looks like. It's easy for people to get stuck in the victim mentality that life is happening to you and that there's nothing that you can do about it. And while, as we've said throughout this conversation, our control is limited, um, our, our conscious control especially is very limited, but it's about being open to the possibility that it can be better and then navigating what that path looks like for you specifically, because there is no one way to do it. Yeah. And I think a really beautiful thing to say, and I've, you know, had so many interviews with so many incredible people, but some of the most, you know, financially powerful people or even like spiritually powerful people, what they will say, you know, and the number one thing that they do say is literally like, they just believe in themselves and they follow their own inner guidance. If you look like I've interviewed so many millionaires, billionaires, and the first thing that they say is they're so connected to their spirituality because that is the true essence of manifestation. So when we think about, you know, changing and we think about being something different, it's all about perception, right? Everything we can allow ourselves to be victorious, or we can allow ourselves to be a victim. And what happens with these most powerful people that I've had, you know, the honor to share their space with as we are going through our own changes is the most beautiful thing is that they've had the most trials and tribulations throughout their life and the most hardships that they could have endured. And they chose the latter. They chose to rise. They chose to be victorious over their journey. And they use that as fuel. They use that as alchemy to allow their experience and their expertise to be something powerful opposed to being disempowered. Wow. That's a really solid way to wrap an episode, Roxanne. Wow. Yes, I agree with you 100%. And it 
just speaks so much to who you are as a person as well, everything you brought to this conversation. And as a person and as a soul, I feel like it's very important, especially in this conversation to to make that uh, distinction because the person that you are who's showing up and sharing the mic with me, I am incredibly grateful to for you sharing your time, space and energy, but your soul is just so warm and kind. And I feel like when we speak about vibration and energy, the first moment that we met through this conversation, um, that just really emanates. And I am grateful for your time and everything that you've shared with us here. Thank you so much, Nikki. It was such an honor. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And so if anybody wants to learn more about Roxanne and what she's doing, you can visit RoxanneShapu.com. I will put that all in the show notes so you can spell it right. I will also put in your social media profiles there. Um, but is there anywhere else that you want people to follow you or go to check out more of what you're doing? Yeah, I'm also on a, an app called Wisdom. And it's a really incredible app about building community of, you know, people that have thoughts that want to share thoughts. And it's a really powerful way to just express yourself. So I'm also on wisdom. So if they ever want to kind of tune in or if they want to, you know, just explore wisdom itself, I think would be amazing. In the meantime, gang, that's all for this episode of Who the Fuck? And we will catch you on the flip side. 